Uh, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Let's begin with a quote from Psalm 19. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. Skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Let's say together this prayer of thankfulness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for his death and resurrection. Dear God, we thank you for your promise to give us your spirit and for the promise of eternal life in heaven. Lord God, you love us, but we don't always love you. We cause you shame when we don't trust and obey you. Please forgive us, make us clean and change us. Help us to live for you and to please you in every way. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We can be sure of his forgiveness and love. From Isaiah 53 we read, He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Our first song is Here I Am to Worship. Announcements for today. So after this service, there are two things happening. Uh, there's a prayer meeting in the hall for Kids Church, and the committee of management will be meeting here in the church. So everyone should go to the hall, have some morning tea. Committee of management people come back here, and uh, the rest please do support us in prayer praying for our kids' church. Next Sunday will be the uh, gift giving for our children in second service. Most of the ministries are continuing this week as usual, but a lot are going into recess the following week. Now next Sunday, important one, after the second service, we'll be travelling 
down to the park, down the end of uh, Mackenzie Street, down the hill here, uh, to have a picnic together and puppet show and some singing. Uh, so that's a lunch next Sunday down in the park. If the weather is poor, the forecast at the moment is not good, but everything can change. Um, if the weather is poor, it'll be in the hall instead of in the park. So it'll still be on, just a change of location. Uh, those are all of the announcements for today. Um, apart from these little flyers that you can give to people to tell people about the activities of our Christmas Eve service and our picnic in the park. Nice little pictures on the front and all the details on the back. So two different versions. So you see Abby if you want to know more about these. All right, so they're in the entryway to the church. So please do take a few to give out to friends and neighbours. So just a little advertising for next Sunday and for Christmas Eve. So just a reminder that we're not having a Christmas morning service. We normally do, but we're having it on Christmas Eve instead because Christmas Day is the Saturday. So we'll be getting together at 6 p.m. And it's a wonderful program of kids' activities, of uh, videos, and uh, also something from the Bible, I expect. So. Sorry, had to throw that in. Uh, those are all of the announcements. We're at item number six. Our first Bible reading is from John chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. And Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there, baptising people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptising at Anon near Salim, because there was plenty of water there, and people kept coming to him for baptism. Uh, this was before John was thrown into prison. Now a debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. But John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptising people, and everyone is going to him instead of coming to us. Your ends the reading. May God bless us through the reading of his word. We're at item number seven. Today we're praying for Nicole Linklater. And Nicole has served for many years in Chad in Africa, in a variety of ministries there. She is finishing up and returning to Australia. Um, it's a difficult time for her because of COVID. She's not able to travel around to the people that she knows there to say her farewells. Um, so it's uh, very depressing for her just getting on a plane and coming back to Australia without, without all those proper goodbyes. So let's support her in prayer. Lord God, no one in the world is more important than you. You are the giver of life and we praise you. Father, we thank you for the ministry of Nicole Linklater, who has served in Chad, Africa, for many years. We pray that you will guide her as she finishes her ministry and returns to Australia. We pray that you will comfort her in her sadness at leaving her many African friends. Heavenly Father, help us to do our best in everything we do today, whether it is relaxing, working, creating, listening, or being a good friend to others. Lord God, I'm sorry that I don't always live your way. Thank you that Jesus died so that I can be forgiven. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our second Bible reading continues our passage from John chapter 3 verses 27 to 30. But John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. The bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. Here ends the reading. 
May God bless us through the reading of his holy word. Our children's talk and children's song. Our children's talk today, Waiting for the Promised Child, Luke chapter 2. God's special baby came, just as God had said he would, and it was an exciting time. Mary, the baby's mother, and Joseph, her husband, had traveled from their hometown to a town called Bethlehem. They had gone there to be counted as part of a census. When they arrived, there was no place for them to stay inside an inn, so they needed to stay where the animals slept. When the time came for the baby to be born, they made a bed for the baby, Jesus, out of hay. It wasn't very long before they had some visitors. They were shepherds. Mary and Joseph must have wondered how those shepherds knew about their baby. Angels. We saw lots of angels. The shepherds told them, An angel told us that a Savior has been born. He is God's promised one, and we'd find him lying on a bed of hay. And here he is. When Jesus was six weeks old, he made another journey with Mary and Joseph. This time, they took Jesus to Jerusalem, to the big temple where God was worshipped. Simeon lived in Jerusalem. He was an old man who loved God and knew God's promise about a Savior who would come to make things right. Simeon had been waiting a long, long, long time, but he never forgot God's promise. God had told him that he would see God's promised one before he died. One day, Simeon felt God tell him to go into the temple. He did. And who should he meet there? But Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. Simeon knew straight away that Jesus was God's promised Savior. He took him gently in his arms and praised God. Thank you, Lord, for keeping your promise. He prayed. An old woman, Anna, was also in the temple. Anna loved God, and she prayed and listened to what God told her. When she realized that God's promised one was there in the temple, she couldn't stop talking about it. Jesus is here. She told everyone who would listen. God is going to save us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news that Jesus was born for us. Help us not to forget this truth and keep it going. Lead us to praise you through all our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our key song today is John fourteen six. John fourteen six. John fourteen six. John fourteen six. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. Comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
we're at item number 12, quote right from Psalm 119. Psalmist says, I am your servant, deal with me in your unfailing love and teach me your decrees. Give discernment to me, your servant, then I will understand your laws. Truly I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. We're continuing our series on passages from the Bible that we can share with people who are interested in finding out what God is like, finding out whether Jesus' claims to be the Son of God are true. One of the most challenging passages is from John chapter 3. We've already read the first few verses, and we take up the reading from verse 31. So I'll read this passage and then pray, and some words of explanation. John 3, from verse 31. John continues, He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God, he speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have drawn us to yourself and we have looked to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have understood who he is and have understood why he died and why he rose again. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. And we ask, Heavenly Father, for our friends, our family members, our work colleagues who do not yet know you, Father, extend your mercy and grace and open their eyes to see the truth. We pray that many would listen to the claims of Jesus and come to him in repentance and faith and receive your gift. We pray these things in his powerful name. Amen. John the Baptist had a very clear job to do. He explains it in this passage while he is talking with his disciples about Jesus. John said to them, you yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. The bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. John prepares the way for people to hear Jesus. Now John had an important ministry given to him by our Lord God. Thousands of people came to him for baptism in the River Jordan. He called people to confess their sins, repent, turn away from sin, and be forgiven by Almighty God. They were baptized with water as an outward symbol of of being washed clean inside by the Lord's forgiveness of their sin. But when Jesus began his public ministry, preaching about the kingdom of God, the large crowd started following Jesus instead of John. This appears to have worried John's disciples. So they said to him, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. Instead of being worried or feeling threatened by the loss of his important ministry, John is delighted. He rejoices at Jesus' increasing success. But John's role is to point people to Jesus. Now there is an important ministry principle here in the example of John. Lots of churches celebrate having large and popular ministry activities. 
But the question is, do they point people to Jesus or to ourselves? An evangelist travelled from America to the small Pacific island nation of Fiji. His team hired the Civic Centre in Suva, the capital city. For five evenings, he preached to the hall filled with over a thousand people each night. On one of the evenings, Abby and I took a group of students from the small Bible college where we were teaching to hear him preach. We listened for over an hour as he spoke, and at the end, of, he called people to come to the front of the hall and pray to accept Jesus as Saviour. About 30 people came forward. But I wondered why? At no point in his hour-long talk did he explain anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He spoke about his own important ministry around the world. He told many stories of his travels to different countries to hold evangelism meetings. He showed short videos of large crowds that came to hear him speak. And I'd already noticed the man with a large video camera standing on the edge of the stage recording the packed hall. But he never mentioned sin, God's judgment, the cross of Christ, or a call to repent and come to Jesus for forgiveness and eternal life. So I was left wondering, what was his message about? And why had people come forward at the end? A few days later, I spoke with a friend who was one of the local church leaders. And he explained that uh, two or three times a year, overseas evangelists from many different organisations come to Fiji to hold big gospel rallies. And thousands of locals come along for the free entertainment, a night out listening to interesting stories. And the same 20 or 30 people come forward at the end. And most of them are hoping to get a job with the foreigners or a visa to travel to America. My friend suddenly looked very sad. He said, They don't talk about sin, God's just judgment, or call people to repent, because then the large crowds would stop coming. The travelling evangelists raise their money by showing videos of their successful ministry back home to their American churches. So they need big crowds at their rallies, so they keep getting their big support money. My friend was quiet for a few moments as he thought about this situation. Then he continued, But this makes ministry very hard for the local church pastors. Calling people to repent of sin and find new life, loving and following our Lord Jesus, is not entertaining. Sin and guilt are confronting and uncomfortable subjects. Telling people they have to hand their life over to Jesus as their Lord is not easy. It's much easier to tell people that God loves them and wants to make their life a big success. Lies are easier to sell than painful truths. We, like John, have a very clear job to do. We want to help people to see Jesus. Therefore, the ministry activities of our church must point away from ourselves and towards our Lord Jesus Christ. I love our church lunches where we get together and share a meal. Like Jesus at the wedding feast, we enjoy a good party. I love the Bible study groups, the after-school kids club, school scripture, the English classes where we talk about Jesus and his word, the Bible. I'm very grateful to our Lord God that I, have, I am blessed with so many church ministries that I find fun and enjoyable. But there are many other things that we do because we are living as disciples of Jesus and because we are serving each other as the body of Christ that are not easy our Lord Jesus experienced in his daily life here on earth the joys of friendship. He loved spending time with his disciples and his friends like Lazarus, Martha and Mary. 
And he knew that the delight that comes from people hearing his message and coming to him in grateful and joyful faith and telling them that their sins are forgiven. and Their Heavenly Father loves and welcomes them. But he also knew the struggles and sadness that come from confronting hard-hearted religious leaders and people who refuse to believe in him and repent of sin. When he sent out his disciples to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, he told them, If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on the day of judgment. Likewise, the gospel message of Jesus Christ that we share in this lost and sinful world will not always be received with repentance and thankful joy. But in all this, we continue to tell the truth of God's word, the message of Jesus. As Paul taught and encouraged his young friend Timothy, saying, You've been taught the Holy Scriptures. They've been given you they have given you the wisdom to receive salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what is right. So we continue to do what John the Baptist did, whether it is easy or hard, fun or challenging, we teach the truth and point people to Jesus. And we become less as Jesus becomes greater and greater in their eyes, minds, and hearts. And the reason he is greater is because we are only from the earth, for he has come down from heaven. John points us to an obvious truth. A person can only accurately speak about what they know and have experienced. So John wrote, He, Jesus, has come from above and is greater than anyone else. But we are of the earth. We speak of earthly things. For he has come from heaven. He testifies about what he has seen and heard. Jesus Christ, the humble carpenter from the little town of Nazareth, existed with God the Father in the heavenly realms before the creation of the universe. And so his message comes to us from the unchanging reality of eternity with our Creator God. But our knowledge and understanding come only from the temporary and changing realities of this fading earthly life. If you've come to Australia from another country with a culture that can be very different in many ways, you know how hard it can be to explain your culture to Aussies. What had been normal and natural to you from your childhood can be strange, foreign and incomprehensible to local Australians. When Abby and I would talk about some of the problems of ministering in Fiji, we'd sometimes hear people say, sure, I know all about Fiji. But what they really meant was that they had spent a week in a holiday resort in Fiji. They'd gone to the local culture experience prepared for tourists. That was nothing like real daily life in the Fijian islands and culture. But even after five years living and serving God there, much of the local culture remained a complete mystery to us. So when Jesus teaches us the eternal truths of heaven, much of it still remains a confusing mystery to us. Our minds and our lives are crowded with the things of this passing earthly existence. But he calls us to stop, contemplate, understand and in limited ways begin to experience the lasting truths of God and eternity. He wants us to view our lives from the heavenly perspective 
to lift our sight and our hearts up to the heavenly realms. But his eternal culture, values and priorities in life are very strange and foreign to us. John tells us, The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. I sometimes hear people talk about the things of this short and often difficult life as if they were top priority, permanent and eternal. But they speak of heavenly things as if they are secondary, distant, unknowable and unimportant. How many of us spend more time worrying about getting our children into a good university or career than in reading the Bible and praying with them and praying for them. Thinking about a new car, holiday or home can easily occupy our minds and give us joy. But how much time and effort and joy do we spend on thinking about and praying about helping our non-believing friends or family onto the road toward a lasting holiday home in heaven? Now, it's not that the enjoyable things of this life are wrong and sinful. They are gifts from God. But they don't last. In our life together, Abby and I have bought four houses and six new cars. But the cars wear out, and the houses will eventually become someone else's property. None of it lasts long, even in this life. I sat with a Christian man whose life had become a series of failures. He had lost his home and his life savings. He kept saying that God must hate him because the Lord had not rescued him from these disasters. Our conversation was not easy or happy. It was a real struggle talking with him about the examples of Joseph, who was unjustly imprisoned. But God was still in control, working out his big plan for the world's good. And we talked about Job, who lost everything. The Lord never explained to him why. The Lord and creator of the universe was still in control of Job's life. And more importantly, we spoke about the important eternal truths of Jesus that anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. But anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. After hours of difficult conversation, he gained a clearer picture of God's love, goodness and presence in the midst of all his troubles. His life now was hard, but by Jesus Christ he had been saved from God's just and eternal anger and judgment. And he could say with Job, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Uh, We thank you, Heavenly Father, that although the world and everyone in it has turned their back on you, you would have every right to simply abandon us to your just judgment. And yet in your pure, undeserved grace, you came after us. You sent your son into the world and he has paid the price that we can be your children now and for eternity. We thank you for the new and eternal home that you have for us in the new creation that is built to last. We thank you that you have opened our eyes and our heart to see the truth 
in the face of your Son. We pray, Heavenly Father, have mercy on our friends and our family. Answer our prayers for them. Give us opportunities to speak about the wonders of your Son and the wonders of life with you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The final song is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.